This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Law and Society at the University of Cape Town. This recording is part of a series of seminars entitled Hashtag Thought Leader Encounter featuring leading and emerging academics on law and society in Africa. If you'd like to find out more about the work of the center, check our website at www.cls.uct.ac.za or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at CLSUCT. Thank you. So I might be a little bit reedy because there's a lot to get through, but I'll try and make my contact. So hello everyone, thank you for the warm introduction, Kelly. As was said, my name is Nigel Patel, and I use they and them pronouns. Thank you for coming to spend your lunchtime engaging on queerness, specifically transness and gender diversity in law. No doubt you're also here for CLS's great catering. I just want to thank... I just want to thank CLS for having me here and setting the space up. Thank you also to Jessica for all the back and forth with arranging the details and anyone else I'm not aware of who has been doing any background work to make sure everything runs smoothly today. So it's quite exciting to have the opportunity uh, to present at the space um, a CLS event. I think I pretty much came to nearly all of the CLS events in third and fourth year. Yay. So it's ref- And it's refreshing to have a space where law is always talked about in relation to society and in an interdisciplinary way. So with that said, the title of today's seminar is Criminally Queer and Queer in Custom. And it will focus on the criminalization of trans and gender diverse people across Africa, largely concentrating in on parts of Southern Africa, and then we'll consider a study on queer resistance through African custom, specifically speaking to a Malawian context. But to start with, I want to play a short Beyonce-esque video <laughs> yes. as a provocation just to get us thinking about the way to frame the seminar. It's not amazing quality, I made it like in my room. <laughs> We teach queers to hide themselves, to make themselves invisible. We say to queers, you can be different, but not too much. You should aim to be free, but not too radically. Otherwise, you would threaten the cisgender and heterosexual. Because I am queer, I am expected to aspire to assimilation. I am expected to make my life choices, always keeping in mind that I must strive to be respectable. Now, respect can be a source of recognition and mutual appreciation, but why do we teach queers to aspire to heterosexual and cisgender respectability, and we don't teach heterosexual and cisgender people to embrace the unruliness of queerness? We raise queers to see themselves as failures, not a patriarchy, which I think can be a good thing, but as failures of family, culture, and love. That they cannot be sexual beings in the way that heterosexual and cisgender people can. Queerness, the rejection of the here and now and an insistence on potentiality for another world. So, queerness. The insistence and rejection of a here and now and insistence on potentiality for another world. Jose Munoz. So what is the here and now, the present that queer Africans are rejecting? I would contend that that present is largely one characterized by the criminalization of queerness. Over the last couple of months, I've been working alongside other researchers to map the laws that criminalize trans and gender diverse people across Africa and the ILGA World's Gender Identity and Gender Expression Program. The report, which will be out next year, is an expansion of the Trans Legal Mapping Report, which in its first two editions covered the laws related to legal gender recognition and gender marker changes, which I'll pass along for people to look through while I speak. So I'm not going to take you through each country, but rather begin by looking at the trends concerning criminalization on the continent, and then we'll turn to consider the continuum of human rights violations 
that occur after criminalization in detention by considering a local and recent Western Cape High Court decision. And then for a second half, we'll delve into a Malawian case, which on my part takes the form of an academic study that will be about a fourth, that will be in a forthcoming book chapter. And I hope this can be used to theorize about the use of the customary as a tool of queer resistance. I must now add the proviso that I'm in no way an expert, and both springboards of today's discussions are pieces of work that have not been finalized yet. So I am here to learn from you, and I want us to recognize that there's a wealth of knowledge in the whole room. Looking at the criminalization of trans and gender diverse people, it's useful just to make sure we're on the same page to have some definitions. So queer is used as a term indicative of the diversity within gender and sexuality, so operates as a way of promoting association between those who transgress the binary and, and heteronormativity. Transgender is a term for people who, and I'm borrowing from Susan Stryker here, have moved away from the gender they were assigned at birth. People who cross over the boundaries constructed by their culture to define and contain gender. And finally, cisgender is indicative of a person who identifies with the gender assigned to them at birth. So there are two overarching ways in which criminalization of trans and gender diverse people occurs. This is an indication of the difficult relationship the law has with gender. Firstly, it occurs through explicit, direct criminalization. On the African continent, this occurs in countries like Gambia, parts of Nigeria, and Malawi. This sort of criminalization is the easiest to spot and critique. For example, a 2013 amendment of Section 167 of the Gambian Criminal Code criminalizes any male person who dresses or is attired in the fashion of a woman in a public space with imprisonment of up to five years and or a fine of 20,000 dollars, which is approximately 440 euros. And it can be objectively said that such laws violate the human rights of trans and gender diverse people and should be repealed or declared unlawful. Slightly more complex to research is the indirect criminalization of trans and gender diverse people. This type of criminalization is common across most parts of the continent. A sort of de facto criminalization, this is where state police practices consistently sanction transgender and gender diverse people using legal provisions that are not on the face of them directly discriminatory towards trans and gender diverse people. And so this occurs in many different forms. One of the most widespread ways trans and gender diverse people are criminalized is through the use of consensual same-sex sex criminalization. Just over 30% 30 of the 54 African states criminalize same-sex sex. So, for example, in 2015, a Tanzanian transgender man and his female partner were arrested in Dar es Salaam on suspicion of violating the provisions against same-sex intimacy. During the arrest, the couple was verbally harassed and assaulted by the police. The couple were detained for two days before being released. So most countries that criminalize consensual same-sex sex use these provisions that are either specifically worded against homosexuality or lesbianism, and more vaguely worded provisions such as gross indecency to criminalize trans and gender diverse people. This sort of criminalization speaks to the fact that trans people are often misgendered by police and other state officials. Thus evident in the example where a trans person is in a heterosexual relationship, this and any sexual conduct in this context is interpreted as being same-sex intimacy. Another strong trend was the indirect criminalization through impersonation, misrepresentation, and fraud laws. So, for example, in 2014, a Zambian trans woman was detained for posing as a woman, dressing in woman's attire, allowing fellow men to buy her a beer in a club and accompanying one to a room. In Kenya, there have been multiple reported cases where transgender people have been arrested and charged with impersonation. Also, speaking specifically to a trans activist from Lesotho, he told me that one of the main challenges trans and gender diverse people in Lesotho face is the inability to obtain official documents, passports, IDs, and driver's licenses with the correct gender identity. This creates unsafe situations and increases the vulnerability of being in, in, interrogated, harassed, searched, and incarcerated by law enforcement officers on the grounds of fraud and impersonation. 
Thus, this issue highlights the link between criminalization and le gender, legal gender recognition. It illustrates the importance and necessity of having laws that allow gender marker and name changes. Additionally, unlike the laws that criminalize same-sex sexual conduct, impersonation, misrepresentation, and fraud laws aren't objectively bad. In fact, these laws are there to legitimately protect people, but instead are used in discriminatory and arbitrary ways against trans and gender diverse people. Moving on, public order provisions related to vagrancy, idleness, and loitering are also used to justify the criminalization of trans and gender diverse people. More than 10 African states use these types of provisions. For example, the vagrancy law on the projector is used in a Rwandan context. The generality of these provisions are often used by the police to justify the arrest of trans people when they were actually acting out of discrimination. Next, what is often cited along public order provisions or same-sex criminalization, as the laws mentioned when trans and gender diverse Africans are incarcerated, detained and imprisoned, is the criminalization of sex work. So, for example, in 2014, seven transgender people were arrested and charged with homosexual relations and prostitution. Neighbors had reported them to police because they had suspected them of homosexuality. Across the continent, trans and gender diverse people, due to their perceived or actual participation in sex work, are arrested under sex work criminalization laws. These laws also generally disproportionately affect trans and gender diverse people who are more likely to have engaged in sex work than the general population, often due to reasons such as exclusion from the education and employment sector. And so what this does is really highlight the need to tackle the decriminalization of trans and gender diverse people from a pro-legalization of sex work framework and to address the socioeconomic factors that contribute to the incarceration of trans and gender diverse people. So when conducting the research, there was also a string of cases where trans and gender diverse people were arbitrarily searched, arrested, and detained without any reasons. A really good example of this is in 2014, where a transgender activist was arrested without being given a valid reason in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, after entering a female toilet. At the police station, she was forced to strip and examined by medical doctors to verify her gender, and after spending two nights in a holding cell, she was only then charged with criminal nuisance. In the courts, the transgender activist was subsequently acquitted of the charge because the use of public bathrooms was not a listed criminal nuisance offense. And so these types of arrests are strike, strikingly highlight the recurring issue of police discrimination and impunity. Finally, in some states, there are specific laws that are not commonly raised in others. In South Africa, for example, and something I definitely learned a lot more about through this work, is that trans and gender diverse people are often indirectly and disproportionately criminalized under laws that prohibit drug use. Speaking to an advocacy officer at Gender Dynamics, it was shared that in South Africa, many marginalized trans people use drugs. The criminalization of drug use is often used as a justification then to harass and victimize trans people due to their gender identity and expression. So now, having briefly gone through some of the common findings of the report, I'm assuming you likely feel, find yourself feeling a little like I did, that is defeated, angry, but also worrying how this information seems to send out and reinforce a singular narrative that Africa is a terrible place to be LGBTQIA+, that is only full of misery and human rights violations. So when doing this work, I kind of personally struggled with how to go about being comprehensive and accurate when researching and documenting, but also not wanting to perpetuate an idea of a dark Africa. So let's get some participation. I'd love to hear some suggestions on how you think this could be addressed. Any ideas on how you might accurately document but not perpetuate an idea of a dark of Africa that is a bad place to be LGBTI? Hands. <laughs> or I'll pick on people like no. <laughs> but I'd rather pick hands. Any suggestions? Yes. Um, so uh, perhaps 
on the African continent. And then speaking to the two comments here, resilience. In terms of resilience, this involves acknowledging the ways in which trans and gender diverse people are not just passive subjects being acted upon, but instead are actually actors with drive and ability to hold the state and the police to account. So for example, I'm working on the trans, I'm working with a trans Zimbabwean who was wrongfully arrested for entering the female bathroom who took the police to court for violating her human rights and is now actually claiming damages and has been awaiting judgment for nearly a year. Which, and this also speaks to one of the uses of the reports. I think sitting down, spending like months like documenting, you're like, what is, what, what is the purpose of this? What is it, how is this useful for people? Um, and I think one of the ways is to name and shame. So this judgment hasn't been out yet. And noting that in the report creates pressure on the Zimbabwean judiciary to come out with that judgment. Um, now, when looking at the continuum of human rights violations that occur post the moment of arrest in a detention setting, for example, just last week, there was a groundbreaking South African ruling in favor of a trans inmate. And I want to take a little time to consider the importance of this ruling. So, on the 23rd of September, the South African Equality Court handed down a judgment in favor of Jade September, an incarcerated transgender woman and sex worker. The court held that the respondents from the State's Department of Correctional Services had unfairly discriminated against September by not allowing, to, allowing her to express her gender identity. September was sentenced to prison for 15 years after being convicted of murder, theft, and attempted theft of a motor vehicle. Serving part of this sentence in spaces designated for males, September was harassed by prison officials for being transgender and prevented from expressing her gender. She was forced to cut her hair and prohibited from wearing jewelry and makeup and gender-affirming underwear. Prison staff also refused to address September as a woman and use she and her pronouns. Ten months after September's case was heard, Judge Chantel Fortain ruled largely in favor of September. The court declared the prison's operating procedures that prevent transgender inmates from expressing their gender to be unconstitutional. It was ordered that September be allowed to express her gender in prison and be addressed as a woman. The judge also provided the option for September to be transferred to a prison space designated for females. And importantly, to help bridge the gap, and I think a conversation that's always happening in South Africa, between inclusive policy and its realization in practice, the court further ordered that all employees of the Department of Correctional Service undergo mandatory transgender sensitivity training. And so what are the implications of this judgment? I would argue that it's a groundbreaking moment in the development of an inclusive legal system that accounts for the spectrum of trans people's lived realities. The fact that the court allowed the option of September to be transferred to a prison designated for females emphasizes South Africa's legal duty to reasonably accommodate gendered difference. The gender itself is ever-changing, and a legal remedy that may work for one trans person may not work for another. The flexible approach to the gender shown by the court 
pushes the law and society to progress beyond the idea that gender exists in a fixed binary solely determined by the sex that one is assigned at birth. And this, em- and this ruling emphasizes that institutions and individuals are responsible for expanding space to allow for gendered self-identification. So now returning to the idea of resistance, the judgment also crucially offers LGBTI Africans an emboldening story of a black transgender woman's resilience in the face of systemic discrimination. And now that we're firmly in the territory of resistance, we can turn to slightly more positive work related to queer custom. So my entry point into thinking about this, I focus on the Chinkoswe, a traditional Malawian matrimonial agreement specifically for my purposes, between Stephen Monjeza Soko and Tiwonge Kuchimbanga Kachepa. Arrested for holding the Chinkoswe, the couple stood trial and were found guilty under provisions of penal, the penal code for illegal acts of sodomy and indecency. So before speaking about this study, I think it's useful to speak about how and why I wrote about it. I think it's beneficial to explain that when we're, I always wonder like what, what does it mean to be interested in like the lived realities of black lesbians when that's not your reality so I think it's useful to contextualize why I came to the work so after moving from Malawi and starting to be involved in queer work in Cape Town I became friends with Auntie Tiwo or Tiwonga as many people refer to her she had moved to Cape Town as a refugee following the pardon from her 14 year jail sentence imposed in Malawi I then did a Twitter thread about Auntie T, just to recognize her as an influential contemporary queer African figure. This gained traction and got me thinking, reading, and talking about, and to Auntie T, on the conflict surrounding her and her Chinkoswe. So now moving into the study, it's split into seven sections, which I'm going to take you through very quickly. In December 2009, the headline of the front page of the Nation newspaper in Malawi read, Gays Engage. Reporting on the Chinkoso between Tiwonge and Stephen, the story propelled queerness into the contemporary Malawian political arena. Subsequently, in the criminal case of R.V. Soko and Kachepa, the couple were charged, convicted, and the maximum sentence of 14 years imprisonment with hard labor was delivered. Reading the newspaper, I recall being troubled by the framing of the story as a gay marriage between two men. I would later come to understand why this was when I learned that Tiwonge, who was assigned male at birth, was largely socially accepted as a woman. Now reflecting on this moment about 10 years later, I realized the Chinkoswe, beyond simply platforming queer life in Malawi, also positioned queerness in a direct relationship with custom. Hence my study unpacks this relationship between queerness and custom through the significant tradition of the Malawian Chinkoswe. What I'm attempting to do is provide an analysis of the relevant literature that places the Chinkoswe and its surrounding events in context, and this gives rise to the question that I hope you all leave thinking about after this ends, which is, where does the queer African appear, if at all, in the customary? And this really provides the basis of a critique of the RV Soko and Kachepa judgment, which is that the cup, which is the judgment where the couple were found guilty. And my critique is that the judgment fails to take living customary law seriously and entrenches the narrative that queerness is un-African. The study then considers an interview which, Tiwong, which locates Tiwonge as a queer African figure within custom, culture, and traditional practice. In doing this, I hope to show the complexities and possibilities that come with queering the customary. For example, the possibility that the customary provides a mode for queer Africans to survive, desire, and resist in a way that furthers queer African futurity. Now, returning to something that we kind of went through very quickly at the beginning, terms and concepts. So the politics of naming when considering queerness and the customary is contentious and difficult, particularly when using English to signify these identities and concepts in an African context. Thus, while I name identities and concepts, these ought to be considered in a way that avoids homogenization and accepts that they are constantly being contested and changed. So notably, Tiwonge, who is a central figure in my work, identifies simply as a woman and not as a transgender woman or transgender. 
Thus, while Tiwangi's positionality speaks to the term transgender, it also speaks against the universal assignment of the term to people and their bodies. Oyuremki or Uemi's analysis that African social categories are fluid, do not rest on body type, and positioning is highly situational as relevant here. Oyuemi's critique offers a way to think about gender, sex, and sexuality outside of the hegemonic Western conception where sex wholly determines gender. That is, one could be assigned male at birth and simply be a woman and simply have a gender without it being framed as transgender. Thus, I refer to Tiwonge on her own terms as simply a, a woman. Looking at method methodology, the study was largely conducted by desktop research and limited as nearly all the texts on queerness up until the 1990s are from cultural outsiders. And to an extent, this continues to be the case. To contribute to the growing literature on direct African address on queerness, the decision was made to interview Tiwonge. And this was further motivated in order to include a powerful countervailing queer voice as a response to the silence of denial of queerness that dominates Malawian cultural discourse. Moreover, I find that the interview offsets the scholarship's tendency to view Tiwonge solely as a subject and not also as a thinker and bearer of queer theory. The in-depth interview was carried out face-to-face -face in Chichewa, recorded, and then transcribed and tra translated. Now moving into the body of the work, the regulation of queer Africans has occurred through law and politics in an international, national, and local level. These regimes address queerness in differing ways which create discourses that speak on, for, and against queerness. Stephen and Tiwongis Chinkoswe is a moment that highlights the tension between these differing regimes. Considering the historical place of queerness in Malawi, the responses to Stephen and Tiwongis Chinkoswe are the product of a fought history of queer genders and sexualities in Malawi. Accordingly, the Chinkoswe and the surrounding events cannot be robustly considered without the recognition of the historical impact of colonization on gender and sexuality in Malawi and the wider Africa. A former British colony, the criminalization of same-sex activity, particularly between males and more widely queerness in Malawi and other British colonies, was in its origin a result of British imposition. Queerness in Malawi does not, however, begin at colonization. Pre-colonial Malawi has a long history of queerness, queer genders and sexuality practices of pre-colonial African societies. The law in place during the colonial period, including the penal laws criminalizing the same sex, remained when Malawi gained its independence in 1964. And along with these laws, the negative perceptions towards queerness also persisted. Now looking at the contemporary moment, specifically at the national, international customary levels, on a national level, the construction of queerness as foreign to Malawian culture is reproduced at the highest levels of government. The president at the time of the Chinkoswe, who was Bingu Antarika, stated that Tiwonge and Stephen, and I quote, had committed a crime against our culture, our religion, and our laws. In line with this statement, the national movement has largely been regressive, as seen in the state introducing the criminalization of same-sex sex between females, and also more recently in the Marriage and Divorce and Family Act that limits the capacity to enter to marriage to persons of the opposite sex. In a similarly reductive move, <coughs> sex is defined as being, and I quote, in relation to the gender of a person, means the sex of the person at birth. Thus, beyond criminalization, this gender essentialist and homophobic laws function to keep marriage out of the reach of queer Malawians. Now, panning out of the national, the place and perception of queerness in Malawi is shaped extensively by international action, through law and politics. Malawi is party to many, many international treaties that contain a number of human rights provisions that protect queer people. However, these only go so far. Moreover, international law discussions of human rights can result in essentialized conceptualizations of Malawian culture as being an anti-queer monolith. And this really feeds into a national narrative by masking queer voices that emanate from within Malawian cultural discourse. 
Additionally, the linkages between human rights and international donor aid has contributed to framing queer movements for freedom as a foreign agenda. And these neo-colonial undercurrents contribute to the resentment towards queerness, which then further casts human rights discourses as an external intrusion and has a negative impact on the possibility for indigenous ownership of the queer rights movement. However, signaling the importance of international action on the lives of queer Malawians, Tiwonga and Stephen were pardoned by the President Mutarika following an instructive visit by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Hence, while international action is significant to support the queer rights movement in Malawi and the wider Africa, it is imperative that international support, particularly from the West, does not set up the movement for equal protection for queer people as a Western gift or force. And this also stops, helps to stop make issues around queerness ones that affect issues around sovereignty. Now, zooming, into, uh, zooming in and moving into the customary, I have two important points to note here. The first is the difference between, and I'm, many, I'm sure many of you know this, official customary law and living customary law. Official customary law is the customary law that has been codified. It is the customary law captured in the statute and precedent that was directly influenced by English legal principles in Malawi's case. And this form has largely been cast, cast under colonial and patriarchal dominance. Conversely, the living customary law is flexible. It is constituted by people's practices, namely what they do and believe they ought to do, as opposed to what the state thinks that they ought to do and courts think they ought to do. So under living customary law, there are generally five main requirements for a valid Malawian matrilineal customary marriage. And the literature on this is largely in terms of cisgender heterosexual couples. But there's nothing to suggest that a marriage outside of this would not be valid. Moreover, the requirements themselves are subject to change as the practices of people change. Embracing this dynamic nature of living customary law, Stephen and Tiwonge connected, conducted a chinkoswe. The living customary law provided them with the space to inhabit the customary. Despite this, the perception that queerness is foreign and so corrupting to Malawian culture fabric persists within the minds of many Malawians. Following the arrest of Tiwonge and Stephen, like the government and religious leaders, traditional leaders also condemned the marriage as un-Malawian. In a study by an academic called Malamba, a focus group was held with four traditional leaders. Commenting on the same-sex, commenting on same-sex relationships, one traditional leader stated, and I quote, this is not how we were taught by our parents to live. This is not part of our culture. These are things coming from white people. Underlying this response is that queerness in the post-colony is rejected in the customary because it's racialized exclusively within the paradigm of whiteness. The, the academic Mutua provides a useful critique that traditional leaders, and I think this is similar to South Africa, rush to talk about culture like it's a pure concept. Traditional leaders acting in despotic fashions essentialize Malawian cultural discourses. And then this contributes to state and religious sponsorship of queerphobia. In turn, this feeds into an international narrative that depicts African culture monolithically. Thus, the grand effect of the national and international customary um, forces is to mask queer subjectivities. And it's for these reasons that my study focuses on the customary marriage between Stephen and Tiwonge. I think this event provides an insight into the way that queer people culturally transgress cisgender and heterosexual norms that are comfortably accommodated within dominant regimes that speak on, for, and against queerness. Now, turning quickly to the judgment, the court do two things in the judgment where they criminalize the couple. So faced with the existence of queerness within custom in the form of a perceived gay chinkoswe, the court placed themselves as guardians of Malawian culture. They conclude based solely from the prosecution's argument that a matrimonial agreement, and I quote, in a Malawian setting indeed takes place between a man and a woman. The irony in this case is that the two accused were largely recognized in the community as a man and a woman. Furthermore, the perception that the accused were both men conducting a gay marriage 
also emphasizes the underlying space that the living custom provides for queer occupation. Now, despite dismissing the Chikoswe as invalid, the judgment does, however, contain slight ambivalences to the possibility that the Chinkoswe was legitimately held under customary law. The court referred to the Chinkoswe ceremony as an engagement or purported engagement. Furthermore, the defense, arguing for mitigation of sentence, states that, and I quote, sending them, the couple, to prison is like sending married people to prison. The finding that this... Two seconds... The court then finds that this argument is grossly wrong for equating the queer chinkoswe, referred to as a bizarre marriage, to the normal practices of any other lawful marriage in Malawi. Despite that, this, these moments of ambivalence around the validity of the marriage are signifiers of queer custom. They call us to ask what might have happened had the state not intervened. The customary in this situation had provided for this bizarre reimagining of cultural practices, a reimagining which rendered culture incomprehensible to the court who could not see the custom beyond the historical shackles of cis-normativity and heterosexuality. The other thing the court do is not take custom seriously, although positioning themselves as guardians of culture. In, priority, in prioritizing themselves as cultural authorities, the court do not take customary, customary law seriously. The court never look at whether the Chinkoswe could have been valid. The judgment fossilizes the interpretation that the customary law's exclusion of queerness is seemingly in line with the penal code, criminalization of same-sex sex. Custom is in fact instrumentalized insofar as the chinkoswe becomes a solely functional aspect to determine if the couple has anal sex. In a clear parallel to colonial administration, there's a preoccupation with same-sex sex between perceived men, which then reduces the proliferation of the queer cultural experience down to the single act of anal sex. Coming to the final part in terms of interview and analysis. So while a lot of what I've talked about today focuses on the Chinkoswe, this should not be taken to reduce queer Malawian cultural existence to this one tradition. Importantly, Tiwonge exists as a simultaneously cultural and queer figure, which and this extends well before the Chinkoswe. Tiwonge commented that when questioned about her gender by people who perceived her as a man, she would explain to them, in my village, I lived with my uncle, Chief Chimbalanga. He saw that I was a girl. When people were rude to me, he told me not to change anything about myself and that I was a girl from the home of Chimbalangas. I was also a woman, like, and this is another quote, like any other woman, like your mother, like your sister. I was born a girl, but bewitched. So Tiwonga's recollections of all her responses to moments where her gender had been put under interrogation drew on culture and relationships. Echoing the witness statements in R.V. Soko Kachepa judgment, Tiwonge was culturally accepted as a woman. And this again upholds Oyuemi's analysis that in many African cultures, relationships have little to do with the nature of human bodies. That is, beyond the Western system of biological determinism, Tiwonge's gender is culturally situated and affirmed by her membership in kinship structures. Evident in Tiwonga's recollection of the Chinkoswe is also the couple's observance to customary requirements of marriage, despite what the court perceived as the unsuitability of the partners to establish a customary marriage. The Chinkoswe places culture and human rights in conversation in the context of this social action. The Chinkoswe shows how significant customary practices can be occupied in a meaningful way by queer people. In fact, Despite the judgment referring to the Chinkoswe as a bizarre practice, the fact remains that queer Malawians have privately been having Chinkoswe's. The only difference with Stephen and Tiwonge was that they chose to have a public ceremony. In an interview with Mark Geveser, Tiwonge commented why they chose to have a public ceremony. It's our culture. You can't just one day wake up and decide you are married. You have to introduce the family to each other. I was well known. I attended a lot of weddings and funerals. This was a way for people to give back to me. 
So Gavisa puts forward the assertion, and I quote, that perhaps Chimbalanga, more than biolo- biologically born women, needed public affirmation of her female place in the world. However, I would like to offer an alternative reading. Tiwonge, it seems, who was culturally recognized as a woman, saw no reason to have a private ceremony. Similarly to females who identify as women, she wanted to adhere to the more common practice of having a public chinkoswe. Following the ceremony, Tiwonge also recalls that the next morning, people from the men's side and the women's side came together. They told me they told me lessons like when the man is sick, you must take care of him. There are certain things you must do when a man is sick. They also said that when a man shouts at you, the women do not get angry. <laughs> and so the implicit question that arises from Tiwonge's recollection here is how far marriage can queer the customary and if placing queerness within Malawian culture might contain it. There exists in the fight for cultural recognition the possibility of developing an African transnormativity and homonormativity. For example, the inclusion of queer Malawians in cultural marriages does not necessarily mean that patriarchal notions of ownership and subordination of spouses will be done away with. Recalling her experiences of court, Tiwonge theorizes the relationship between queerness and Malawian culture. In court, and I'm quoting her, they said to me, I broke the law and married my friend, a man, but I am a woman. But even if I wasn't, then why would that matter? We have freedom in our culture to do things we want. Also, this culture where people think a man must marry a woman only. No, everyone has their own freedom, and within our culture, we have the freedom to do what we need to do. Bingu, who was the president, was insulting me at rallies and conferences and campaigns. He says what I did was not Malawian, but no, it is Malawian culture. So evident here is the crux of what I'm trying to say. Culture provides a powerful resource for queer people to assert their interests. Speaking on politics and culture, Tiwonge simultaneously claims her Malawianness and queerness. Culture is conceptualized as furthering a pluralist agenda and in doing so, enabling social change. Resisting the systematic silencing and denial of queerness that was instigated during colonization, Tiwonge's cultural labor works to unmute, unsee, and unlearn the outright erasure of multiple forms of evidence of queerness. So in conclusion, there's an unmistakable history of queerness in Malawian culture. Queerness and custom are both amorphous. The fluidity of queerness is complemented by the flexibility of living custom. In many ways, and I'm quoting Munoz again, queerness is not here yet, It is a structured and educated mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. In a similar fashion, the Chinkoswe is a tradition that constitutes a possible future. It reveals the possibilities for diverse queer community to entwine queerness and culture. Thus, the queering of the Chinkoswe allows for us, and I'm quoting Munoz again, to dream and enact new and better pleasures, other ways of being in the world, and ultimately new worlds. And there are those who would critique marriage for being cis-normative, heteronormative, and a patriarchal institution, which does raise the valid concern, is it possible to queer customary marriage at all, or is what we have here in Stephen and Tiwonga's Chinkoswe an African form of homonormativity and transnormativity? And in response to this, I raise the finding that this concern is mitigated when queerness is allowed to destabilize legal discourses centered around official customary law. In conclusion, the Chinkoswe configures the living custom as a site of queer struggle, recognizing that queerness in living customary law allows us to then recognizing that queerness in living customary law allows us to then celebrate this queer chinkoswe without making it the archetype of queerness. Under a living customary lens, the queer chinkoswe is just one of many articulations of queer Malawi. In other words, it only marks a moment in the development of a radical queer politics. A politics that is not just inclusionary of queers under culture as a form of tolerance, 
but one that reconfigures the ordinary. This Ching Kosue teaches us to look at queer lives first and hold culture accountable to what we need, rather than looking to culture to see how much of queer life can be fit into it. Thank you very much. So I think we should maybe take questions. I'm also going to hand out, this is what I said I was going to do, sisterhood. People are like, okay, what do we do? Okay, this is nice academic stuff, but practically speaking, sisterhood has just produced a magazine. They're a group of trans sex workers in Cape Town. Um, if you're interested in getting a copy, come see me and I'll give you the email of the person. It's 150 rand, but it's nice. <laughs> um, so I'll pass that around and have a look. Questions and comments? Okay, yeah. Uh, no, I just thank you very much for that. I'm sorry I wasn't here just to listen to the first part. Um, I have two questions, um, and they, they may seem controversial, but they are um, well intended. So the first is in the ethnographic part of, the, of your work. How does, how does a researcher avoid the problem of the native informer? Which, what, what I mean with that is, how do you, how do you in, uh, prevent ending up reporting um, and therefore explaining and rendering knowable um, the queer subject to the very colonial um, hegemony that, that and, and its structures that one wants to undermine. So that's the that's the first question. Um, and the second question is, I guess I'm asking you about the the question whether the Ching Kosue is a beginning or an end. And it sounds to me like you're saying it's a beginning, but the experience in South Africa of of same-sex marriage has very much been heteronormalization. It's very much been assimilation and, and into the heteronormative journey. And, and so I'm wondering what would be required for that next step, for that Chinko Sway to start to, well, let's just call the spider spider to find out marriage. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Nigel. Um, so I, I'm uh, intrigued by and struck by um, uh, what I want to offer as a question and perhaps a, a not well articulated question. Um, so what I'm wondering is, in all sort of uh, instances of trying to find a, a way to express yourself, there are costs, right? There is the um, the risk of backlash. And so if we're thinking about, uh, as I understand you to be positing, the culture and cultural space um, as, as having these offerings of uh, an ability to, you know, queer custom um, and to really begin to craft uh, an understanding of an African queer identity, I wonder, are the stakes higher in the cultural space? Um, and what are the stakes in the cultural space? So I guess what I'm inarticulately trying to get at is it must really um, more than hurt to be told that what you are is foreign, an abomination, not part of this thing that is inherently a part of how you identify yourself. And I'm just wondering, yeah, if the stakes are different in the cultural space and, and if they're higher. One more question and then I can try and respond. It's in time to think. <laughs> Anymore? No. Okay, I'm not going to be safe. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 there we go. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, this is a little bit hmm, left of left, <clears throat> but um, I was thinking about another way of challenging customs. So I was looking at the, the age of consent in Malawi. 
Um, I, Google says 14. Um, so I was thinking about how we challenge the nature of human marriages. Like, it's a consenting thing. To me, there's nothing... If, if there are two people who are consenting to something and have the capacity to do so, then the abomination was... They're so, they're so emotive. So would it maybe be a line to challenge the age of consent in a country and what that means about, you know, abominations? Um, I mean, a 14-year-old, I don't know about that capacity, um, versus questioning the capacity of people who are queer to, you know, think for themselves and to consent to a marriage. Uh, yeah, it's just a thought. <coughs> Um, this is just a bit of a comment to also just give you time to think about all the questions. Um, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed um, the first part of your presentation where um, it was very subversive in the way that instead of Chimamanda's uh, interlude to the Beyonce song, it was you speaking about trans rights. And yeah, I thought that was a really great way to get the discussion started. So congrats on that. Thanks, <laughs> Um uh, Cool. I'm going to start with Nalindi's question, because I think it's the one that I can answer. <laughs> um, whether the cultural space has higher stakes. I think, so I was in Joburg last week, and there was a convening of queer people across Southern Africa, um, run by the other foundation, and also parts of West Africa, and it was really interesting to talk to people from Botswana, who've just had the decrim judgment. And I think the whole point of queer cultural work is that the stakes are high within the cultural space, but they also are high in the legal space. Um, so they really emphasize and they push the idea that one of the reasons they were able to get decriminalization in Botswana is because they, weren't, they didn't solely rely on a human rights discourse. So they looked for cultural values. And in Botswana, and if you read the judgment, it refers to what Botswana's hold as their cultural values. So not necessarily like we're just wording too, so not necessarily the human right to equality, but that everybody has value, that Botswana's want to treat each other fairly. Um, and so, and those are drawing those from culture, which then helped, they, it was, this is what's their um, argument, to affect decriminalization, but also after decriminalization, to make sure that judgment is taken up by communities and is used, because that's the other thing. If you just rely on human rights discourses, which you do, which is legal speak, which you must, but only rely on that, you end up, sometimes I think you end up somewhere like South Africa a lot of the time where there's that divide, um, where you have, I think Dee Smith calls it paper rich, um, but not necessarily, communities haven't taken that up. So I think, the stakes are higher in that sense, and the stakes are higher in the fact that they're um, personal in a, in a way that general human rights discourses aren't. What I like about that, and I, what I think is helpful from watching uh, and just engaging with people, is that when you're doing, when you're getting people together in a space, it allows people to talk a lot more freely. So if you frame a discussion around, like, let's discuss the Sogi principles you're only going to get certain people engaging with you and taking that message back. Even when you're doing training workshops, if you just go like use like the sexual orientation and gender identity um, codes, I think that what then happens is it stays as like a professional field, but then at home, which is what we're looking for, we're looking for recognition not just in courts, but in ho at home, cultural language gets into those spaces. So the stakes are higher, I think they're the most high, to be honest, because they spread across. The law doesn't always spread across, but the culture, I feel like, spreads definitely across into the law. Um, Yaku's very hard questions. Um, I'm going to do the first, the beginning and end one in assimilation. I think it does result in assimilation in a lot of ways. Um, I can only hope and I only think that maybe customary law marriages are a little bit different to civil law marriages um, in that that people can change what they want about it quite simply and as long as you've got 
that family buy-in, you're okay, which I think gives opportunities to maybe fuck around with marriage and open it up to more people. Um, but I also think it, oh yeah, it always results in some type of assimilation, um, whether that be in South Africa, in interesting cases, the way that sexual violence happens also within marriages. You know, again, property regimes within marriages, queer marriages aren't necessarily different. But again, and I think of Zetu Matabeni when she says this, queer people want to get married, and like, who, and who am I to be like, that's not radical enough. Um, and hopefully that allows us to move to a place that can push, that you can push for a radical policy. I think it's better to be able to allow to be married and to or recognize that it is the cultural right to marriage and then refuse to do that or do that in a new way. Because um, currently, the only cultural marriages are, are very assimilatory. I would hope maybe a couple of years from now that that might change, but I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the ethnographic um, native informer, how do you start reporting? Um, yeah, I, do, I think you're always reporting in a sense, because especially in academia. Um, but also making sure that... So I think there are multiple ways of addressing it. Making sure that what is taken to an academic realm, like the university, is also then taken to communities and used up in communities. So it's not just reported back to the power structures to change laws. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, I think one thing that always stays with me is an academic advocate called Denai Mupotsa who says you'll always be trying to render people almost transparent and that's violent and sometimes it's okay not to explain everything. So even within this, I think what's always interesting is the ideas around mysticism, witchcraft, and people being like, oh, explain that more. Let's hear why does... Tiwonge think that she was bewitched and now is um, fits or res is a woman because of that. Um, and sometimes I'm like, that's not for me to explain. That like that's enough. Like that's not necessarily the purpose, and I'm not explaining all of her story, but parts of it. Um, but it is difficult. I think I still do. I still do it. I'm still making Tiwonge legible to people in the audience um, and wherever the work goes. Um, and then consent. So I think that I'm not sure if they, I, I'm not sure if the age of consent is 14. I thought it was 16, but I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure on that. Um, again, I'm interested. I think in language and the way people that use people use language. So if you focus on, again, I'm speaking specifically from a queer perspective, not necessarily thinking about age. Um, and consent. If you use the argument that, oh, it's two adult people consenting, why is this a problem for you in a cultural setting? That doesn't go down as well as um, this person is respected in the community, that person is respected in the community, let them do what they want to do. So I think it's important to link those discussions, and I think consent discussions are useful in the legal sphere. Again, consent and age I haven't given enough thought to, so I don't want to kind of pull a response out of the air, but I think linking the discussions between consent around age and consent between queer people to drive a conversation around consent, also within queer communities and issues around consent and age within queer communities um, is a useful is a useful tool, but I'm not 100% sure. And Priyanka, thanks for appreciating the Beyonce interviews. <laughs> um, Chinamanda is an interesting human being, um, so it's, it's nice to it's nice to, yeah it's nice to subvert um, African cis feminism. <laughs> any any other questions? Okay, yeah. It's so freezing in here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I really, really, really like your work and some of the key points that you're making about uh, queerness and custom. And especially your comment or your question about uh, where does a queer appear within African cust the custom or, cust or customary? 
And in relation to that question, um, I'm wondering because a lot of what uh, is queer is framed from a Western from a Western perspective. So when you're looking at uh, what is queer within the custom, how do you avoid the Western framing of queerness, um, erasing uh, African ideas of queerness that may even pre you know uh, exist Western ideas of queerness? I don't know if I'm framing that. Another question. I see it. There's one hand here. Any other questions? Hi, thanks. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, how do you manage the, when you're looking at cultural norms and, and a community saying this is not in our culture and, and a group of people saying it is in our culture, uh, to me culture seems very subjective, um, especially between generations. It's what we grew up with. It's what we're used to. And I I think it's difficult to say to someone, no, your concept of your culture is wrong because they can't say the same thing to us without, without us getting upset. So how, how do you navigate the fact that culture changes over time, that, um, that we can't say to someone your culture is wrong if we want them to respect our culture? And how, how do we square that up against the law, which is a codification of our culture, it's a formalization and an objectivization of our culture to remove that subjectivity. How do we navigate that and, and fight for change? Cool. One more hand. And... Um, yeah, thank you for the question. It is cold in here. It's cold in cream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So yeah, where does the queer appear in African custom? That's like, if I could just do that kind of work for the rest of my life, that would be great. Um, and Western perspectives. I mean, the use of queer already is an interesting dynamic. Um, s- slowly being taken up, but even just the word like queer and queer and queer, like the words, like the way it's used and the way it's taken up is, is interesting. Um, Language, I think, is a large part of it, and what's erased because of language. Um, I think the association also with queer and like city and urban spaces, and then also the idea that customary law also doesn't exist in city and urban spaces. There's like a correlation there, and which I, which I think again, how do we disrupt the idea that queer only exists within the city? How do we disrupt the idea that customary law only exists in a rural context? Um, there's some really great projects that are trying. So there's a great project called Find New Words, um, which goes around and engages with queer communities trying to find words that they feel identify them in correct ways because a lot of the words within our communities, like Malawian word is like a horrible word, um, like it is in a lot of other places. The idea of reclaiming those horrible words, I think, is even harder because queer is easy to reclaim, or easier to reclaim, because a lot of, I find, African words that point out queerness are very, like, visual and are very, like, talk about, like, bring it down to an act. Um, So I think that there's a whole conversation around language that needs to happen. But then again, I also find when you're like when you're engaging with people and they're like, oh but queer is too hard and then English is too hard to engage queerness. I find that people can get they get lazy when it's queerness, but they're happy to talk about like epistemologies of racism. <laughs> but then when you're like, oh queer, they're like, oh we don't know this thing in English. <laughs> um, so I think it's recognizing that English isn't perfect but it allows us to recognize and speak about those issues. Um, and I think it's also, yeah, doing, doing research work, there's always debates. I mean, even just doing this report, there's a debate around trans and gender diverse, trans and transgender. Does gender diverse not mean, is everyone not gender diverse in a lot of ways? What does gender non-conforming mean? Does gender non-conforming also include cis? And I think it's also then just being able to be, especially when doing like human rights work like this that gets taken up and then used as a language, 
making sure so like when I was in contact with people from Namibia they were like we'd rather use just trans and making sure that that's okay because a lot I find with the international human rights work there's like oh framework and standard and there's standardization um, and how the standardization doesn't necessarily translate we, like we might not be able to use the same term of gender trans and gender diverse across the whole world um and yeah, so yeah, and erase, I, yeah, it's difficult. Queerness, I definitely think, still also does erase and alienate some African people and from the conversation. Um, so finding indigenous ways, I would say, and indigenous ways also to reclaim English, not just uh, indigenous languages. The other question was on cultural norms and that it's subjective. So it's subjective until it goes to the court and then they're like, this is objective. <laughs> so I think, yes, everyone recognizes it's subjective, but clearly there seem to be people who have objective understandings of culture and can re- change culture, not change, but their pronouncements of culture are have more weight. Um, and I think, thinking about it strategically, which is what we're trying, like how do we, I'm often approaching it, how do we use culture to get this, or how do we use culture not, you know, how do we use culture in a way that stops it from being used against us? Um, And in relation to that, I think also a critique of the queer community is that, and then kind of narrative that goes around is there's there's always been the, it's queerness is an African, it's it's not of the African culture. And a retort to that is, oh, homophobia and transphobia is un-African. But then what you end up having is a kind of a stalemate of, I'm calling you an African, I'm calling you an African. And I think there's use again in getting people up, getting people to a table and having discussions about the way culture is complicated. Because I think not everyone is thinking about culture from like a sociological point of view. It's, their, it's what they live in. So for them, at that point in time, it is objective to that person. Um, and yes, it's what we grew up with. But again, I'm always like, when it goes to the court, it's not what we grew up with. It's, it's all of a sudden, it's this is the way that things are run here. And sometimes that can be used in your favor. Again, I think the Botswana judgment is great for finding cultural norms that are objective and that have been with Botswana for years and using those to advance um, queer rights. So it's finding queer, um, not queer cultures, it's finding language in a culture that I think that relates to human rights but isn't in a human rights language that can be used in a court um, to advance decriminalization because that's also what I'm generally thinking about a lot. Um, and I think that was it for questions, yeah? Did I get another one? Um, so I have a question. Oh, there we go. Um, more of a request, if you will. Um, if you're trying to sort of break into the space of queerness and understand from an outsider point of view, um, I find it quite difficult because you hop on Google and then everyone has something to say. <laughs> and I've been trying to educate myself so that it doesn't come across as, hey, you're queer, queer. please do the work for me and educate me. But if you wouldn't mind, mm. <laughs> <laughs> could you make no, a recommendation think... on like, maybe some reading to do or something that at least I have something to work with? Yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, outside of points of views and working with queer communities, I think a lot of queer people can understandably and legitimately be hostile to cis and hetero people coming into communities and working and then going out and being like experts on communities Um, and then also issues had a whole day of conversation around issues around allyship um, and labor and labor of education I always take it from the point of view, especially when, you can kind of tell when you're doing like workshops, for example, who's like done a little bit of work and who's coming from it from a totally like, I'm here to like ask hostile questions only. Um, And it's at that point that I'm like, that's not, and then under the guise of like, oh, I'm here to become an ally, but I'm going to ask all of these really like, these questions that show that I haven't done any of the work, but I'm also not actually here to do the allyship. 
In terms of readings, um, and in terms, it depends on. I always think, why, why, why are you doing what you want to do? What do? Why are you doing? Why are you interested in it? Why are you wanting to learn? I think if you're learning because you're engaging with queer communities, and that's that's a whole other dynamic. But if you just uh, want to learn more and engage with it, I think there's always queer people are always putting things out and are always inviting people to spaces. And I think the framing of spaces is important. So quite often, queer organizations will have, or queer people will get together and they'll have times where they're like, okay, this is where you can come and engage and ask questions and we're putting this out. And then when they're like, oh, we just want to chill together and like actually deal with internal issues, maybe that's not the space to start being like, educate me. But I think trying to look out and find those spaces where people are educating. So at UCT, Rainbow UCT is always having events, and they have when when I was there every second week, I think, where people spaces where people could just go and ask the questions that you're afraid to ask anywhere else. Um, so I think engaging on spaces and not being afraid to call, be called out. People are called out all the time. Queer people are called people out all the time. They're calling we call each other out. We're calling other people out, and it's often I think. Not coming from a place of hostility, not always, sometimes it is, not always. Um, but just being like, it's a call in, I think, is the, the idea that they're actually what trying to educate, um, and being okay with that and just listening, I think. Um, but it is, it's a, it's a difficult and it's, it's a process. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, also just getting involved in organizations, people also just, like, people show up, so like, when the judgment was released in Jade September's case, there was an announcement of just people to come support in court. And as, a, as if you're studying law, that's just a nice way, number one, to get into court and see and hear a judgment, but also then just be a body that shows that queer people aren't like a vulnerable population and aren't just a minority. So I think that's a good way. And through that, people, you'll have conversations. And I think that's always also like a great way to learn. Like personally, it's not just like definitions in a manual. Cool. I, are we done? Are we good? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigel. That was absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you for your time, your thoughtfulness, your preparation, your willingness to be here. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, we have an event tomorrow on refugee rights in the same venue at the same time and there will be lunch then too and next week Wednesday we're having an advice assembly with the people from Ndipuno Kwasi in and please RSVP to all of those things thank you and I have my magazine back <laughs>